Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, we have Professor Porter here with us to give us a talk on microwave medical technologies, uh, foundations, and clinical applications. Uh, about Professor Porter, um, she is an assistant professor with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin, where she is associated with both the bio ECE and electromagnetics and acoustics re research areas. Dr. Porter uh, was granted her PhD in 2015 from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. She also has an MEng and a BEng in uh, electrical and computer engineering completed in 2008 and 2010, respectively. More recently, Dr. Porter was an NSER postdoctoral fellow and then an EU uh, Marie Curie research fellow with the Translational Medical Device Laboratory at National Achievement at University of Ireland, uh, Galway from 2015 to 2000, 2019. In 2021, she was awarded the IEEE Lot Shafai Mid-Career Distinguished Achievement Award for her contribu contributions to microwave medical technologies, standard, standardizing the methodology for measuring the dielectric properties of biological tissues and advocating for women in engineering. Her research interests lie in applied electromagnetics and particularly aimed at developing EM-based uh, solutions with applications in diagnostic, therapeutic, supportive, or assistive medical technologies. So thank you very much again, uh, Professor Porter, for being here and giving this talk to us. Great, thank you for the introduction. I will share my screen. All right, so you can see this okay? Yes, it's perfect. All right, perfect. So uh, if anything goes wrong or you have questions, I guess feel free to speak up as you wish. Um, since I might not be able to see the Zoom questions, so feel free to interrupt me. Um, in any case, I would like to tell you a bit about my work today. Um, I first want to just go high level motivation and then I'll talk to you more a bit about the foundation and clinical applications specifically that I'm interested in in this area. So first of all, the goal for us is to have needs-driven medical device development. So we want to kind of design our engineering solutions with the patient and doctor in mind after having consulted them and see what they need so that we're designing engineering things that can you know, be like immediately helpful to them instead of just that are interesting from the engineering perspective. So we want to have a tangible impact on patient care. And that kind of drives the idea of our problems. And then we cover obviously the whole spectrum from design and development, and usually like early pilot testing of our devices and try and bridge the gap between industry and academia. Because even though like I personally like the research side of things, these medical devices aren't actually gonna get to help patients unless some industry people invest in it and commercialize the technology. Right, so this is the ultimate goal. So these stats might be two or two years old or something by now, but I'm sure things haven't gotten better with COVID. Um, but anyway, the, the challenge is that med tech startups are really hard, really competitive. Uh, it's really expensive to bring new devices to market. And we it's really easy to get patents, but it's not easy for those to generate income. So it's hard to convince investors that your idea is the winning idea that will solve some huge medical problem and that's worthy of investing in. So we really need to make sure that we're kind of like hitting on the right story or the right clinical need that is gonna interest those investors to participate in the clinical translation phase for our technologies. So basically we just wanna ensure that our technology has a realistic shot of one day reaching patients. So to do this, we need to consider not just our technological solution, but the entire process. So what is the clinical need? Do doctors and patients support it? Is there a big enough market that investors are gonna wanna invest in it? Um, how is our insurance companies gonna be paying for this? Is the patient gonna be paying for it? Are we better than competitors in this space? All sorts of things like that, right? And once we understand all of that, 
um, like what are the criteria and constraints that the device ultimately needs to satisfy, then we try and find an engineering solution that meets those. Um, another thing, especially in my area, that's really challenging is the clinical trial process. If we want to demonstrate that our new device is better than existing ones, in some cases, that's like a massive burden. So for instance, there have been proposed microwave imaging for breast health screening, and that's going up against competitors like mammography, which is well-established. There's been studies over 20, 30, 40 years of the technology with millions of people involved. So how could we possibly meet the burden of evidence that our technology is equivalent or superior? So it requires really careful um, thought and consideration to make sure that you know one day this, this technology actually has a shot at, at reaching the clinic and patients. So that being said, I think this is a quote from Abraham Lincoln. This is what my postdoc supervisor always used to say. Give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening the ax. So basically prepare a lot. And then once you know everything about the problem, work to solve the problem or work to develop your engineering solution. So you might've heard other twists on this before, like work smarter, not harder, or fail early, fail often. That's all kind of the same idea, right? If we want to make sure that our solution is going down the right path as early as possible. Um, so that's kind of the general philosophy, I guess, of the lab. Um, but what comes hand in hand with that is that we need to do some fundamental research that we can build our technologies on. And then we also need to do some research on the engineering side of the technologies once we have the idea in place. So that's more where I'm gonna to transition to now to talk about for the rest of the talk. So I wanna give you an introduction to the motivation behind the microwave medical devices. Um, the motivation for the dielectric properties of tissues, which are the foundation for these devices. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. Let me turn on a pointer. Okay. Um, the dielectric measurement process, how we deal with heterogeneous tissues, and then clinical applications. So first of all, why med microwave medical devices? Uh, there's a bunch of motivations uh, depending on kind of like the subspace that you're in, but in general, they can be made quite low cost. So these are the same frequency range as, you know, like Wi-Fi and our cell phones. So there's a lot of, you know, like low cost components that you could possibly use. Um, in general, the microwave devices are non-invasive, so they could be wearable on your body. Um, they are non-ionizing radiation in this frequency range, very low power. So with these combination of features, you could have devices that are regularly monitoring someone 24 seven if you wanted to, and that would still be safe. So this allows it to fill gaps in clinical pathways that other technologies like MRI or CT wouldn't because you can't reasonably do very frequent scans with those because it's too expensive, it's too cumbersome, and there's some health risks. So this is kind of the motivation for microwave devices in general. There's a lot of different clinical applications that have been proposed. Um, my work is mainly in kind of like imaging, monitoring, diagnosis, but there's also been um, proposed technologies for treatment of disease using microwaves. So like microwave hyperthermia, where you heat up the tissue that's diseased to try and make it more susceptible to chemo or radiation. There's microwave ablation, where you stick a microwave antenna into the disease tissue, crank up the power and try and kill all the cells in that area. Um, and then there's other active implantable devices in NeuroSim, which is a bit further outside my area of expertise, but these are also up and coming areas. So all of these technologies, I wrote EM, electromagnetic here, and of course microwave is a subset of the electromagnetic range, um, but all of these are based on the underlying dielectric properties of tissues. So the relative permittivity, epsilon r, and the conductivity, sigma. These are fundamental characteristics of tissues. 
and they quantify the interaction of fields with the body. So how much of an incident electric field is reflected, transmitted, or absorbed in the body. And it's usually the transmitted or reflected field that we're trying to measure and detect to try and work backwards and see what the permittivity of the tissues are. And that tells us then in turn what tissues are present. So these parameters are obviously key design parameters in diagnostic and therapeutic technologies, all of the microwave technologies in general, um, and also in, in determining safety. So if the um, wave is causing too much heating in the tissues or not, these parameters are used for those types of calculations. So depending on the application, these parameters quantify different key design parameters. Um, so for instance, in imaging applications, they may play a role in determining the dynamic range that we need, the signal to noise ratio that we need to detect disease tissue, and the estimated wave propagation speeds. In treatment, um, it could help us in targeting the location of the disease tissue and in determining specific absorption rate, which helps us determine safety. Um, overall, they play important roles in the feasibility and efficacy of microwave and RF medical devices. So just a reminder, um, this is, I know this is the a APS community, so maybe you're already familiar with this, um, but just in case you're not, um, the idea here is that when we have an incident electromagnetic wave coming in and it hits an interface between two tissues, um, the amount of the wave that goes through that interface and that reflects back are both proportional to the different dielectric properties on both sides of that boundary. So you can see it here written in terms of the intrinsic impedance, which is dependent on mu, the permeability, and epsilon, the permittivity. So in our case, in our frequency range, tissues are pretty much non-magnetic. So we don't need to worry about the permeability. We only tend to examine the permittivity. And examining the permittivity helps us understand this field scattering behavior. So how do we know what the dielectric properties of tissues are? Uh, the dielectric measurement process that is most common across the microwave range is actually super simple. We have a pen-like probe. You can see, actually, oh, here's some actual pictures of it. And here's the diagram. It's just like a pen. It's an open-ended coaxial probe. You put it in contact with the tissue sample, connect it to a VNA, and it records the reflection coefficient or the S11 at this tip. And that reflection will be different depending on what tissue properties are here. And based on that idea, we can convert that reflection coefficient to an estimated permittivity of this tissue. So if I had a tissue sample here and I wanted to measure the properties using this method, it would, it would really take like a minute or two. It's really fast procedure. The challenge here is that historically and currently, really the dielectric measurement data for different tissues have been really inconsistent. So inconsistent that it's hard to make sense of what's kind of going on really. So if we're talking about microwave breast imaging, which is the most common, most frequently studied application in this area so far, um, the early studies going back you know, 30 years or so, showed a really strong contrast between tumor tissue and healthy tissue. So a stronger dielectric contrast means more um, of the wave that's reflected, meaning we're gonna be able to measure it more easily. Um, then later studies found only maybe like a 10% contrast between the tumor and healthy. This is a much harder problem. We need much more sensitive measurement tools to pick up such a small difference especially when there's gonna be you know, background noise and clutter from all these random scattering paths. Um, so that was bad news for the field. However, some people had built microwave imaging prototypes based on these early studies, and they seem to be showing promise with patients in the clinic. Uh, 
So overall, this is kind of an inconsistent result and it's unsatisfactory for medical device development, particularly if you think back to that argument you're selling to investors, right? You wanna make a convincing story to investors that this is definitely gonna work. This is the best technology to solve the problem. And I think with investors see something like this uncertainty, it's it's a risk, right? You might not want to invest millions of dollars in something that seems like the foundation is unreliable. So what is causing inconsistencies? There's a lot of confounders that impact the measurement results. Um, some of them we may call errors. Some of them are probably true confounders. But things like equipment-based uncertainties and clinical or tissue-based uncertainties. Um, and so far, a lot of potential confounders have been identified, but the significance of many is unknown. And as a result, a lot of them go uncontrolled and unreported. So if you're reading a paper that shows dielectric property measurement results, there may have been many confounders that impacted the results, but weren't actually reported. So it makes it that the results from different studies are different and we can't really understand why. Um, here's an example of some of the known confounders. So obviously frequency, properties change with frequency, they change with temperature. And there's other things like drift and cable movement, the quality of the sample contact, the pressure that you apply when you're trying to measure the sample, um, the age of the animal or the human, and the tissue heterogeneity. So this one I think is one of the bigger problems and I'm gonna come back to that later. On the other hand, some things that have been identified, but it's the literature is either conflicting as to whether there are problems or not, or they haven't been well quantified. That's this list. So if the measurement's ex vivo versus in vivo, does that matter? Does it give different results? Um, there's been kind of disagreement in the field about that. The type of animal, the age or weight, or the weight or sex of the animal, how the sample was handled and stored. So for instance, if you took the tissue sample, put it in the fridge and then measure it later, does that affect the properties? Um, histological analysis. Sometimes when there's high heterogeneity in tissue, we do histology to understand what tissues were present. And there's no standard way of doing that. Everyone does it differently. Um, how we report the properties in terms of closed form equations through dielectric models, whether there were drugs or anesthesia given to the animals before samples were excised um, in different physiological parameters like blood flow or oxygenation levels. Now, these are hard things to measure and compare. So I wanna focus on that heterogeneity question because I think in the breast cancer area, particularly this is a big problem. So for homogeneous tissues, the measured properties are really easy to interpret. Wherever you put your probe on this sample, you're gonna get pretty much the same measurement. So this is just an example. If you have homogeneous muscle, you get the blue trace. Homogeneous fat, maybe you get the green trace. And no matter where you put your probe all around the sample, you get approximately the same trace within, you know, maybe one or 2% measurement uncertainty. As I mentioned, we've actually measured the S11, but what we want is the complex permittivity. So we have a conversion method that converts S11 to permittivity. And I don't wanna go into the, the details behind it, but all the different conversion methods assume that we have a homogeneous material. So we have a probe really that's only capable of measuring a bulk properties of the tissue sample. It, it can't distinguish between different heterogeneities within the sample. It just assumes the whole thing is a homogeneous region. So when we have heterogeneous tissues, what ends up happening is you have kind of like multiple layers of tissues in the sample. And depending where you put the probe, you're gonna get a completely different result. And basically if you have something that's mixed like this, 
put the probe here versus here versus here, you're getting totally different values. So are those values actually meaningful or how do you interpret what they are? That's kind of a question that we've been dealing with. Um, you can just measure, say, 20 times across the whole sample and report the mean and standard deviation, maybe. Um, but for more, like as microwave technologies advance, we're looking at more local and local scale things like the ablation applicator is inserted in the millimeter scale region. So we really want to understand more how heterogeneity is affect on a small scale instead of just reporting kind of the average across a whole organ. So there are three problems with measuring heterogeneous tissues. The first is if you look at this tissue sample that has a fat layer on top and muscle on the bottom, it's one quarter fat and three quarters muscle. You put your probe on top. <coughs> In the measurement, the fat contributes 73% and the muscle only 27%. So the percent volume of tissue within the sample is not equal the percent contribution of that tissue to the dietary properties. So it's very hard to interpret what this data means. The second problem is that we actually don't have a good grasp on what the sensing volume of the probe is, which means we don't know which tissues within a bigger sample actually contributed to the measurement. When we've looked at previous studies, especially ones that have done histology, we see that they use just a square or rectangular sensing region. I think because that's the size of the histology slide when you do slices. Um, but I mean, in terms of EM theory, the field should be radiating something in more like a, a hemispherical or um, maybe elliptical shape. But it also might be the case that the field propagation depends actually on the tissue content and the losses in the tissue. So it's hard to determine what is the actual sensing volume and therefore what tissues actually contributed to the measurement. This is particularly problematic when we have the heterogeneous tissues. And I guess this problem three relates a lot to the second problem, which is that if we do know our sensing region, we can still have different heterogeneities within that region. And we don't know how much tissues at different locations contribute. So the contribution is thought to vary with tissue dielectric properties themselves, uh, the location of each tissue, the contrast in properties, and probably the frequency. So basically, it's very complicated to try and understand how heterogeneities within the sensing region are actually contributing to the single bulk measurement that we get with the open-ended coaxial probe measurement. So we've been trying to, I don't know, work out a way to deal with this and to understand better the measurement of heterogeneous tissues. And this is really important because most disease tissues are actually quite heterogeneous compared to healthy tissues, or at least we're going to have disease tissue that is interfacing with, with healthy tissues in a way that is very, um, I don't know, very non-smooth boundaries. So it's important to try and measure that accurately. So we started looking at very simple scenarios. So in these two cases, we have only two tissues present. So sure, they're heterogeneous. They're not homogeneous within the sensing volume, but they're super simple. Only two tissues present. Um, and in this one, we looked to measure the sensing depth. So we had the second layer of tissue slowly moving further away from the probe to see when we could no longer detect it. And in this one, we tried to measure the sensing radius where we have the tissue slowly moving away to see when we could no longer sense them. And then we looked at simple heterogeneities. So if we have a homogeneous background with just one small inclusion of a different type of tissue, how does that small tissue contribute to that bulk dielectric measurement? So very, very simple scenarios, just to get a better feel for the problem 
All right, so these graphs look kind of messy. Um, if you look on the left side, this is a graph of the sensing depth that we measured across frequency. The different um, uh, the different like dash versus solid are different tissues present in the region. And then we looked at um, different thresholds. So here I said, we're moving the target away from the probe to see when it's no longer detectable. How do we define detectable? Is it no longer detectable within 2% error, 5%, 10%, and so forth? So you can see from here, uh, I guess two things. The first is that we kind of have results that in some cases vary with frequency, but they definitely vary with definition. So if we're saying we want a 5% threshold or a 10% threshold, that's changing the results a lot. Um, so that means that the way you define sensing volume is basically a confounder itself in the measurement process. And there's no standard way or agreed upon method for defining it. For sensing radius, we have more or less the same thing. Uh, you can see it's less variant across frequency, but it does depend on uh, the definition a lot. And it also depends now on the tissue properties, like which one is immediately under the probe. So then on to the simple heterogeneities. Um, the details don't really matter, but we had different target material here, moved it around in different locations and across different frequencies. And then we made these maps. So D versus R, D is up and down axially from the probe and R is sideways perpendicular to the probe. And again, we have our thresholds detectable within five, 10 to 20%. Um, so we can see that with these heterogeneities, they're actually detectable kind of like in an ellipsoidal pattern. So they um, have some changes based on the tissue that's under the probe versus which one is the inclusion. That's the top versus the bottom. Um, but in general, like it's roughly ellipsoidal and they're roughly the same, maybe just small differences in the um, cutoff points for say the dark red regions. So overall, like once we dug into this more, we found that the sensing volume likely depends on frequency on tissue type the tissues which are in the region and the tissues that are under the probe directly and the dielectric contrast between these tissues. So overall, uh, it's very difficult to model this sensing volume. And if you have more complex tissues, multiple tissues present in multiple different regions of your sensing volume, that's a really difficult problem to solve because you need to understand the sensing volume to understand which tissues contributed to the measurement in order to understand what the dielectric measurement result means. But you can't really identify what is the sensing volume unless you know which tissues are in the region. So it's, it's a finicky problem. Um, one thing that we've been trying to work on um, that can help with all dielectric measurements and maybe not just the, these heterogeneous ones, which are particularly difficult, is to try and make a standard or a guideline um, for reporting for dielectric measurements. So we proposed um, what's called MINDER. It's a minimum information model for dielectric measurement of tissues. And it's basically just a list of data and metadata needed to be able to duplicate and interpret the study. So it enables reproducibility results in comparison between studies. And the idea here is that all those confounders that I listed, um, we suggest measuring and reporting what they are 
maybe not all of the, all of the confounders. Most of the confounders are the ones that the evidence shows is important. Um, and so we can encourage people to report those. So hopefully in the future, we can understand better how they affect their results. Um, but that's kind of where we're at with this, the dielectric property measurement scenario. The, the measurements themselves um, have been really inconsistent. And when you delve further, um, there's no good solutions on how to better achieve accurate measurements for heterogeneous tissues. So there's um, kind of like a lot of disagreements in the field about how we should handle this and what's the best way going forward. Um, but I think from having studied this sort of stuff for a few years that there's, there's no good answer. Um, this is a, a challenging area and it's, um, it, maybe we need to in, invent new measurement techniques or, or something like this. For instance, I've seen um, studies where we do imaging of the tissue sample with micro CT in order to understand what tissues are present and what contributed to the measurement. So maybe there's something like that in future work. Um, okay, so that that was very, um, I think, cumbersome, the discussion of the dielectric properties of heterogeneous tissues. And even though it's a topic that I worked on for four or five years, it's one that you can very easily get like stuck in the weeds of. So I would like to move on now to what I hope will be uh, a more interesting topic um, for you guys, but just to keep in mind that kind of the, the understanding of those tissue properties are what are the foundation for all of these clinical applications. Because all the clinical applications are based on the idea that there's some contrast between the target we're trying to measure, which is usually a disease tissue, and the healthy background tissue. So there's three clinical applications that I wanted to mention. Um, the first two, I'll be a little bit brief, and then the third one is the most recent one that I've been working on, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that one. So first of all, the typical pathway in this field to developing the clinical application typically starts with simulation, where we make a model of the tissues under consideration. We make our antenna array, choose our types of antennas, and try and optimize stuff like what type of antenna would be the best, how many antennas, what's the layout of the array, um, are the antennas directly contacting the body, or is there some sort of matching medium necessary? Um, all sorts of different parameters like that to try and make sure that when we get to experiment and clinical testing, we've got some insight into what's going to work here. So once we have some promise in simulation, we usually try and build an experimental system. So I'm showing you an example here with microwave breast imaging. This is an antenna array with 16 elements in simulation. And then this is the same 16 element antenna array on a tissue phantom. Um, this is a very simple tissue phantom. It's just hemispherical, but we eventually made some nice phantoms that you can see are very kind of anatomically realistic. They had multiple layers. There was, there's adipose, there's glands, there's skin, there's, um, you can put tumors at different locations and stuff like that. And then once we're happy, kind of with experimental testing, it shows promise we go on to do a pilot study with human volunteers or patients. And that's typically where kind of my general interest in this area ends. Um, so we show that it could work, but um, haven't delved too much in the commercialization area yet. Although that's something that we're working on now because some of the students that I have are really interested in that um, like startup spinoff type thing. So that's the general pathway. So I mentioned before that microwave breast imaging is the most common microwave medical technology. I don't know. I mean, I guess I know why. Um, it started probably almost 30 years ago now. One of the things that makes imaging of the breast using microwaves particularly promising is that you have access to the whole breast. So you can surround it with antennas. And um, a lot of breast tissue is adipose based. So it's low loss 
meaning our microwave signal can travel through the thickness of the breast and still rec receive a measurable signal. So I think those were the two promising motivations for microwave imaging the breast. And it's been proposed for different applications. So for instance, as early screening complement to mammography um, for monitoring health of people who are at high risk of developing cancer or reoccurrence, or for monitoring treatment of tumor to see if the chemo is working quickly. So different things like that. The basic idea of the microwave imaging is you have your antenna array around the breast, maybe on the breast, you propagate electromagnetic fields from one antenna, typically collect with all the other antennas, then propagate with another antenna, collect with all the others so that you obtain multi-static signals. And based on this, you can reconstruct an image of the scattering. So um, based on collecting all the scattered fields, you can try and work backwards and see where was that target or tumor that caused the scattering waves. And there's many different ways of constructing images. So I'm not going to go into the detail on that. Um, but that, that's the general idea. Hopefully we can make a map of scattering and that shows us where the, the tumors are. So we made experimental systems. And one thing that was interesting uh, was the difference between benign and malignant tissues. Because if you're proposing microwave breast imaging for a screening technology, you ideally want to differentiate between benign or non-cancerous lesions and malignant lesions. And there's this interesting study that we did about different lesion shapes and sizes with the speculation tending to, tending to indicate more likely to be cancers. Um, and we did that with experimental tissue phantoms and just ended up doing a bunch of studies about under what circumstances we could image these. And then we applied machine learning algorithms to see if we can classify the difference between benign and malignant um, based on these measurements. So the, these microwave imaging systems have actually been tested with um, healthy patients for monitoring and patients in the clinic. Um, and I think the results are promising, but it's not been like a slam dunk, if you know what I mean. Like there's some promise, but there's some cases where it doesn't work, especially with dense breast tissues, which is also where mammography tends to fail. So if we're talking about matching and outperforming our competitors, it's not, the case here has not been clearly made yet. Okay, another one is microwave ablation. So this is treatment of disease tissue. One possible case that's interesting is the treatment of Kahn syndrome. So this is a nodule on the adrenal gland that produces extra um, excess hormone production and is a cause of hypertension. So one of the proposed applications of microwave ablation is to stick your microwave ablator into the zone, ablate the tissue to basically kill the cells in the nodule and then prevent that excess production of hormone. And it's done in a way that's really non-invasive um, you can insert the needle through the skin so you don't need to do open surgery. Um, and again, basically done some different simulations to see how the heating affects and some tests on, on different animals to see what the ablation zone looks like under different things like amount of time and power being ablated. All right, get, I want to get on to the last clinical thing. I'm watching the clock and I want to leave time in case you have a few questions. So the last topic that I've been researching recently is about microwave bladder state monitoring. So this one's kind of different because we're not trying to monitor or image disease tissue, but we're trying to measure changes in healthy tissue and the changes of the bladder volume. Uh, the motivation for this was that urinary incontinence specifically affects hundreds of millions of people worldwide. There's many different types of it, but it can be particularly challenging for elderly, like in care homes, for children, and for individuals with um, like intellectual and developmental disabilities, learning to toilet train, for example. All sorts of negative health consequences and social consequences of not being continent. Um, so definitely you want to 
I mean, we wanted to have a support tool that could help people with their urinary incontinence. Microwave technologies in general could be promising for this because they've already been demonstrating promise in other tech, in other uh, clinical applications. We know they're low cost, non-invasive, safe for regular monitoring, and they can be portable or wearable. So it could enable proactive monitoring of the bladder. So say a kid with intellectual disability is struggling to learn how to become toilet trains, he wears this monitor, and when the bladder's full, it triggers an alert to go to the bathroom. So it happens before an accident occurs, but it doesn't encourage going to the bathroom unnecessarily. It, the idea is that hopefully it would encourage them to realize the sensation that the bladder's full and then go to the bathroom. So far, the studies to date in this topic were super limited. We had these very simple tissue structures that were used to test the idea, which did show promise, but I mean, they're a lot simpler than the actual pelvic region. And so we wanted to do something that was a bit more realistic to see if this idea actually is something that would be possible or not. So we developed some somewhat more realistic models based on um, MRIs from the Human Visible Project and the Austin Man model. And you know, we put our antennas on the, the pelvic model and tried to do some measurements with them. One thing to note here that I, I found really interesting when my student was telling me this is that the once they made the pelvic region, in order to do a simulation with one antenna to just record the reflection coefficient, that simulation size was like 180 gigabytes. So even with the Texas Advanced Computing Center, which is apparently one of the best computing centers in the world, we could not solve that. So we had to end up cropping the pelvic region to make it smaller. And it's just because the, the pelvic region is so highly heterogeneous with many tissues, they're very lossy, and the detail in the heterogeneity is very high. And um, we're using microwave frequencies, so we need to discretize to a certain extent to be able to resolve the field propagation appropriately. So it's a hard problem to simulate this accurately. Um, we did, we tried to simulate it, I think across one to five, one to four gigahertz. Um, with full and empty bladder. And we looked at different urine conductivities at the same time. So here are the results. Full bladder, 450 mils, empty bladder, 50 mils with just that antenna on the pelvic region. Here's the S11. And this was with different properties of urine from different studies in the literature. So this was bad news. Um, we do not see any change in our measurement with bladder volume, which was the thing we were trying to measure. And we see a lot of change with different urine properties, which is not what we were hoping to measure. So overall, this needs further investigation. Maybe we can do an array or maybe imaging will help instead of just looking at the single S parameter data. But this was kind of a, wow, maybe this is not a promising thing to continue investigating at this stage, right? Um, so I just wanted to share that with you as kind of a, you know, so, sometimes things are continue to be promising when you look into them and sometimes not so much. That's just the nature of, of research. Um, but in any case, it was a fun project. So overall, I think there's a lot of promise for medical technologies based on microwaves. They have that promise for low cost wearable frequent monitoring, which I think could fill a lot of gaps in the clinical pathway. Um, we probably need to understand the dielectric properties better in order to gain a better foundation for these technologies. And it'd be great to have some standard guidelines for repeatable measurements in that area. Um, and I think it's really cool because we have a potential to combine diagnostics with therapeutics. So you could do microwave imaging of a region and then do microwave hyperthermia and track the treatment using the microwave imaging to make sure you're targeting heating the disease tissue in the right location. Um, so it's great because the imaging aspect allows you to have the treatment very targeted to the individual level. And then you have the treatment um, that can also be monitored. So there's a lot of potential here, I think. Obviously it's my research area, so I find it interesting, um, but I, I think we'll see hopefully more of this in the future. So I will stop there. Thank you very much for listening. There's my email address in case you have any questions. Um, I'm gonna click through a few pages of references so you have it on the recording.
just in case anyone wanted to pause and see what they were. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, very, very wonderful talk. Thank you for uh, going through all the applications. Um, so let me ask the audience if they have any questions. Um, I, I think you can unmute yourself, but let me just check that. Um, okay, I can stop recording right now.